Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Assembly of God. As you can see, I am not in the sanctuary this morning because of this wonderful snowstorm that we are having. Uh, we are not having church, but we're still coming to you with a message from God's Word today. And uh, so, as we are going through our uh, lesson this morning, uh, let us pray that this cycle that looks like it's going to happen again next week, let's pray that these storms be pushed aside to happen on Monday or Tuesday, uh, a better day uh, of the week. I will tell you that I miss coming together, and I hope that you are missing being in the house of the Lord also. So today, let's begin uh, with a word of prayer, as we always begin our services. Lord, we come to you this morning, even though we may not be together uh, in person, though we may not be actually in the house of the Lord, may we still be in your presence. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us today. Let your grace watch over us, we pray. Keep us all safe. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I'm going to speak to you from the Gospel of Mark. I'm um, sorry, Gospel of Matthew. Looking right at Matthew and said, Mark. Okay, so if you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 2. Now, today, uh, we celebrate Epiphany. Now, Epiphany is actually January the 6th, uh, this Sunday. Uh, is January 7, and so we are uh, celebrating it a day after. But epiphany is a simple word that uh, means the shining or the revelation, the manifestation, and uh, it is uh, the manifestation of the light of God shown to the Gentiles. In Christmas, Jesus is shown to his people. He came to his own. And in January 6, the wise men, representing all of the Gentiles, Jesus is shown and revealed to them. So let's read uh, a scripture, Matthew chapter 2, uh, verse number 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, we have hinted at this, we have referred to this during Advent a few times, and uh, this morning we're going to talk a little bit more about this event. Now, as we have been celebrating the candles of hope and peace and joy and love, uh, we celebrated, it culminated with the lighting of the Christ candle, and that of all of the candles together, uh, when you put all the lights and hopes and peace and love and joy, when you put them all together, that is Christ. And we celebrated Christmas. We asked last week, did you get to Bethlehem in all of the celebration this year? And we hope that you answered yes. Now, there are two accounts in the Bible that talk about the birth of Jesus in a direct way. Now, we're going to see those in Luke's Gospel, the first two chapters, and then here, as we are looking this morning, in Matthew chapter 2. Now, uh, some of the, uh, when we read John chapter 1, we're going to see that John chapter 1 is actually a veil uh, of, and a, and a pointing to the Christmas story. But that's our last point, so we'll, we'll hold that. Uh, for then. And so the wise men uh, come in our story this morning, the wise men come to visit Jesus. Now, uh, the wise men in reality did not come to the manger. In our lesson here this morning in Matthew chapter 2, it clearly comes and says that they came and they saw the child, not a baby, but the child. They came to the house where Jesus was, uh, he was not in the stable now. Now, I know when we celebrate Christmas, when we do the nativity scene, you know, we will have everybody there. We will have the angels watching over the manger and the heavenly host. We, we will have the shepherds, the sheep, the oxen, the donkey. We will have 
the shepherds. We'll have the little drummer boy. Uh, and then, yes, we will have the wise men presenting their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. However, in reality, the wise men did not arrive at the stable, but in our putting everything together, we don't have, you know, 15 days to celebrate Christmas in the story, so we put them all, all together. The point is that they were involved in showing the Christ child to the entire world. So we began by reading the first verse of this wonderful passage of Scripture. But if we go down through, there is a sad Scripture that we will read, and that's going to be our... Uh, if you like Chinese food, there's a sauce called sweet and sour, okay? And there's sweet and sour chicken. And this is, this is Advent and Lent together. We cannot have one without the other. And that's our point in our sermon this morning. We are going to have love, but we are also going to have pain. So you remember in this, and I don't have time to read the whole scripture down through this whole passage of scripture, but as the wise men were getting ready to go home, the angel of the Lord warned them to go home a different way and not to tell Herod that they had found and where they had found the Christ child. After they left, and Herod sent his men, and he killed all the babies born under two years old and under. And I'm sure that there were probably a few babies that were a little bit older than that uh, that, were, that were killed. Now, if Herod had gone with the wise men to look for the baby, uh, you know, we know the rest of the story. We know that Jesus was in jeopardy under Herod. And if he was under jeopardy after the wise men left and went home, he certainly would have been in jeopardy to, for, him, for Herod to come with the wise men. And the angel of the Lord warned Joseph in plenty of time to give them time to flee down to Egypt. And so if Herod had come with the wise men, he had no intention of worshiping or honoring this baby born king of the Jews. The sharp sword of Herod would have been just as hard, just as sharp, and just as thirsty for blood on that day of worship by the wise men as it was when they, Herod realized that uh, the wise men were not coming back. And so, as we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, Herod is looking for the Christ child, not to worship him, but he's looking him as a, as a rival. He recognizes that the wise men are not coming back. Now, he would take no chances with this child, whether it was royalty or not, whoever he was. His life was not anything under Herod. So, bloodshed marred the first Christmas story. And it seems that bloodshed will not end. Even this past Advent season, you will remember in late fall, how that uh, in Israel, Israel was attacked. Women, children, the elderly, babies, uh, just regular people were massacred, the horrors of which I cannot repeat for the horror of, of it. Bloodshed is all too common, even in the day that we are in today. Now, usually after or during Christmas in the Holy Land, there is a place in Bethlehem, uh, there's, a, there's a church that is built uh, called the Church of Nativity. And, uh, you know, they, they uh, hold that as the, play, the birthplace of Jesus. Now, folks, uh, that was 2,000 years ago. Uh, in reality, we don't know 
where the birthplace of Jesus was, except that it was in Bethlehem. Uh, now, the Lord did that for a reason. Uh, people in our, the way that we are, people would worship the place more than they would worship God. And so God's never into idols, okay? He's never going to do that. But it's a place that is held with uh, dignity to honor the birth of Jesus. Now, this place, maybe someday, if the Lord tarries, maybe someday, I would, I would like to visit that place. Uh, but right now, no, that's, that's the last thing on my bucket list that I'd want to do today. Because it would not be very, very, it would not be very safe. Now, some people have visited it. We have people in our church that have visited it. And so, uh, it's, it's not a very uh, ornate place, a very simple place, a very humble place. And uh, a little while ago, uh, someone came up with the idea. Uh, because right now, what happens is the pilgrims, these Christian pilgrims, they come every year. And they stay at uh, hotels over in the Jewish section. And the, 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 the hotels will bus them from the hotel over into the uh, occupied section uh, where Bethlehem is. And they'll take them there. And they, they get to spend like 20 minutes. They walk through the church and they see the place where they are holding as an honorary place of Jesus' birth. And, they, you know, a few minutes later, then they get back on the bus and they go back to their hotel. Well, someone had the wonderful, great, genius idea not to make money off the pilgrims or anything. But they thought, you know, what? wouldn't it be wonderful if we take the parking lot, uh, which is only really for buses and you can't drive into that area at all. But if you took the parking lot and the buildings around that, if they... Put in little shops and, you know, little delicatessens. and maybe, Then they could uh, make a couple dollars off the pilgrims buying and selling souvenirs. And maybe they get a donut or, or something while they are in the area. And so uh, they put this idea out there. Now, it was so popular that people from around the world, they, they donated money left and right. In fact, there was a, an NPR radio program just on this uh, a short while ago, and uh, they said that uh, they had raised more than $40 million to, to build this area right around the Church of the Nativity. It would include a grand, luxurious, super-duper, so-secure hotel to think that you would be able to spend Spend around Christmas in this wonderful hotel and be able to walk over and see the church and and you could buy you know memorabilia and souvenirs and so they raised more than forty million dollars. Well, the project uh, went. I almost said that it went forward. It didn't go forward. The project went. Lots and lots of money has been spent. The project now has spent. Uh, they think that they spent more than $80 million, uh, but there's been very little construction. The hotel isn't even, you know, they don't even have the ground floor built yet, but they've spent millions and millions of dollars, and they have very little to show for it. In fact, a lot of they don't even really know where all the money went. Uh, there was so much red tape, and then they discovered that the government officials that were in charge of it uh, had embezzled the money and uh, there was red tape and it was just going nowhere. Uh, there was uh, there were some bombings that happened in the area and uh, it, people had died in this effort to uh, commercialize uh, Christmas. Now, in all, in all reality, let's be, let's be honest about this. It's really not a place for celebrating Christmas. And it's certainly not a place to make money off Christmas. No, Bethlehem, the city of Bethlehem, is Christmas. When you think of the word Christmas, Bethlehem comes to mind. 
and you cannot say the word Bethlehem without thinking Christmas. Christmas is a story of the birth of Jesus. And here we see that corruption has infiltrated even the best effort of thinking to make something that would be nice. Uh, corruption knows no time or date. Uh, the corruption dates way back to the time of Herod, and ultimately go further back than that, but remember when Herod did what he did from political corruption and those the blood of those children upon the swords of his soldiers. And you remember the words of Jeremiah, the last verse in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning. The last verse reads, A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. So Bethlehem, as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, Bethlehem corrupted by Herod. Bethlehem corrected, corrupted by Herod. Now Bethlehem was a sleepy little town. Remember that Bethlehem, Bethlehem is a city of David's birth, his birthplace. He grew up. We think of Bethlehem and we think of Psalm 23, Psalm 23 right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We think of David watching sheep on the backside of his father's uh, farm, okay? And we we think of David maybe penning those words while he is there. And Bethlehem is this sleepy little shepherd town. Now, in the days of Jesus, Bethlehem was the town where the temple flocks were maintained. At this time, uh, that Jesus was born, roughly about 4 B.C. on our calendar. Jesus, in Jesus' day, the temple sacrifices, the morning and evening sacrifice, a lamb was slain each morning and each evening. And so to supply them was a constant supply of lambs. The flocks were maintained at the little village of Bethlehem. And so we see this Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That is what John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. John spoke those words. And so we have the symbolism of, of the very place where the lambs were take were uh, born and brought from there to Jerusalem to cover man's sin to the ultimate Lamb of God being born there who would not just cover man's sin but would take man's sin away. Now, as we said earlier, uh, as we began, corruption knows no bounds. Okay? There was corruption in Jesus' day. There is corruption today. There's corruption on in many levels, from the highest to the lowest. If we had no record of Herod's corruption <coughs> excuse me, at this time, if, if we had no record of uh, Herod sending his soldiers to kill and probably this little town, at this time, that town probably had like 2,000 people. And out of a community of like 2,000 people, there probably would have been about 20 uh, babies being born, or between 10 and 20 babies being born a year. And so we're looking at maybe 20 babies, 30 babies uh, being uh, killed by Herod. Now, if we didn't have the biblical account and, and we just discovered 
that this had happened, if we found something that showed that this happened uh, in history, would you be shocked? If we had no record before this, and we just learned this, would you be shocked? Would you be shocked today if you pick up the newspaper and you read of some politician who has done this or done that? Uh, would you be... <coughs> Would you be shocked by it? The, the, the thing is that nobody, nothing shocks us today much, does it? We can, we can hear of, we can hear of just terrible things. And we're appalled by it, but shocked? No. Back in 1999, Excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat. I just can't get rid of it. Back in 1989, Beth and I celebrated our 25th anniversary by taking a trip to Hawaii. It was beautiful. Now, we it was sort of last minute. Someone helped us put it together. And so when we were landing in Hawaii, uh, the stewardess was getting helping us to get ready to land and get our suitcases and everything all that. And so on the plane, uh, she asked us, said, now, do you have your passports ready? And we, wait a minute, passports ready? Hawaii is a, Hawaii is a state. We don't need a, and of course it was a joke, right? It was a beautiful place. Every, one of the things that we did was uh, we just, we toured. Uh, we actually visited three different islands. We were uh, on the big island, Hawaii. We were on Maui. Uh, not very far from the big fire in uh, Maui this year. And then we were also uh, over on the last island going up uh, northwest, uh, Kauai. And it was, it's a beautiful, it's a flower. They call it the flower island. And it was just beautiful. Um, it seemed like every place we went, we turned a corner and there was just more beauty and more, more beauty. And, uh, one of the things we discovered is that back in the mid-1800s, uh, a pastor, Wilcox, uh, went there and opened a mission. And for uh, many years, he was responsible for the education uh, in Hawaii of the children. And then his children and their children, uh, they continued uh, being a very positive uh, influence, very godly influence in this on the island of Kauai and yes he was my great 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 uncle or cousin I'm not sure exactly what that you know there I doubt that there was any got to be related somewhere right but I said all this to say it was it's such a beautiful place and uh, I read I bought a book about uh, the the history of of uh, the Wilcoxes involved with uh, um, evangelizing and things. And uh, so, uh, but then when I came home and I began to do some other research about the, uh, about Hawaii, uh, there was, there, there were some, some things that I discovered that kind of took a shine off Hawaii. Uh, do you know that Hawaii uh, leads the United States in the number of uh, both parents having to work to uh, meet the family's financial obligations. Uh, Hawaii leads the country in uh, child poverty. Uh, Hawaii, most of the time, Hawaii leads the country in drug abuse and in alcohol abuse. Now, we never hear that in the news. We never hear when you pick up a brochure, come visit Hawaii, the number one drug abuse state in the country. You know, we, they kind of put that in the back burner. And some of these things like that, when you hear that, it kind of takes the edge off and the, and the beauty. It kind of takes that off just a little bit. Now, <coughs> in Bethlehem, the curtain is pulled aside. 
Now, you know, this is an obvious reference to uh, The Wizard of Oz. You know the movie The Wizard of Oz? In The Wizard, when Dorothy and her friends come back and they want to see the mighty Wizard of Oz, um, as they are trying to see the wizard, uh, there's thunder and lightning and noise, you know, and everything. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Toto, he grabs a hold of a curtain and he pulls the curtain aside and you see this little guy and he's turning these whistles, turning these handles and wheels and everything. And he's manipulating on the screen this great and mighty wizard. And he says, pay no attention to that man behind uh, this screen. Well, the curtain is pulled aside um, on Bethlehem. We sing the song of O Little Town of Bethlehem, but then as we have talked a little bit this morning, we've pulled the curtain aside and there are some things here that are not so, not so pretty about Bethlehem. <coughs> Kill all the babies, right? We read that. And we read this in this passage of Scripture. It takes the shine off the story. Now, we ask the question, how in the world, how in the world did Herod get away with that? How in the world did Herod, how was Herod allowed to massacre a village's population of little babies, two, two years old, and how, how did he do that? Wouldn't you think that there would have been a public outcry? Wouldn't you think there would have been masses in the street revolting, uh, removing him from power? But the truth is, Herod was a very bloodthirsty man. Herod had many people most of his political enemies, he had them put away. One of his wives, Herod, was getting older. There were assassination attempts on Herod's life. And one of his wives just asked him in passing, not trying to <laughs> usurp authority or anything, but she asked him, have you thought about who would be your successor? If something happened to you, who would take your place? Well, because she asked the question, Herod had her executed. He had her son executed. <coughs> and a little while later, he had another son executed. No one was safe. He ruled with an iron fist. Anyone could and did just disappear. Jerusalem was accustomed to that. Israel was accustomed to that. No questions asked. The shepherds might fall for this baby born king of the Jews, but Herod was having none of it. Herod knew this baby was a rival. He knew this baby had to be dealt with. The idea was even stronger than a physical baby. Herod joined the ranks of dictators. What's well, a little bloodshed to maintain power? What does the world do today just to keep the peace? We know that in the last hundred years, there have been dictators that have killed lots of people, but just for world peace, lots of things have been swept under the carpet. Uh, thirdly, in our uh, last point uh, this morning, Bethlehem, you will give us a Savior. And this comes from Micah chapter 5. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. 
So when the wise men arrived in Jerusalem, they had been following after the star for some two years to get to this place. And they went to the palace. They should have kept following the star, but they went to the palace. Where is this baby born king of the Jews? Now, that was a, a natural uh, thought, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't to be. Herod didn't know. He didn't know the answer to the question. He was, he was upset by it. And he asked the rabbis, and they looked it up, and they, sure, they, they were able to find Micah 5 to Bethlehem. That's where the baby, that's where the Messiah is going to come from. They knew the scriptures, uh, and they pointed Herod in the right direction. Now, we know the end of this story. We know the end from the beginning, and it's hard to be surprised when you know what the uh, end is here. But what I want us to see this morning, and this is the theme of our lesson today, is that there was a shadow that was hanging over Bethlehem, all of those dead children, just as there was a shadow hanging over the manger. And that was the shadow of the cross. Now, a Savior, he comes into the world with a cost. What did it cost for Jesus to come to the world? Well, it cost heaven's best. It cost the Son of God his very life. And it will come with a cost today to everyone who makes a decision to follow Jesus. There's a cost to be paid. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Now, remember I said earlier how that uh, we have Matthew and we have Luke that speak of the birth of Jesus. And it was John chapter 1 who in a sense, he speaks of the birth of Jesus, but he puts it in veiled terms. John chapter 1, and many of you know this verse by heart. And in fact, many of you could quote several of these verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Everything was made by him, and apart from him, nothing was made that was made. And then down in verse number 14, the story continues. And this is here, this is where the Christmas story is spoken of in veiled terms. And John continues, the word, which is another word for Jesus. He's the, the son of God. <coughs> oh, I have a sneeze going on. I apologize. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. See, Jesus was born. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Now, as we read through these stories, we understand them to be the Christmas story and the crucifixion all rolled into one. So as if you were to take the time and go back and read the first three verses of John chapter 1, and then you read verses 14 and 15, and you read them slowly with your knowledge of the birth of Jesus and with your knowledge of the crucifixion, you can see both of these great events <sighs> being spoken of in veiled terms. Now, we must realize that the story of Jesus' birth comes with great joy, and it also comes with great pain. And we have talked about some of that joy and some of that pain in the announcement of Jesus' birth to Mary. And in the midst of that, we see that there's going to be pain ahead. Just as Bethlehem, you're going to give birth to a Savior, but at the same time, you're going to have a situation 
where Rachel is weeping for her children who are not. We actually don't get very far along with love without coming to pain. That is life. And I ask you a very honest question this morning. Do you have any joy this week? I bet, you know, yes. Did you have any pain this week? And just as quickly, yes. Did you ever hear of a young man uh, or a young lady? It goes both ways. Uh, they fall in love and they think this is Miss Wright. They think this is Mr. Wright. No, they're so in love. This is love. This is real love. And then the story continues and one of them, Mr. or Miss, goes their own way and the other person is left like a sad puppy. And they are devastated that, you know, here, I thought that was love. I thought it was real love. I thought they were the one. And then, if this was real love, then why does it hurt so much? And why does love have to be painful? And love ought not to be that way. Well, hold the horses. Stop the presses. We may feel sorry for the guy. Maybe you, maybe you were that guy once. Uh, but he has a misconception of love. Okay? He has no, no idea that love sometimes is going to give us pain. There will always be pain in love. There's going to be good and there's going to be bad times. There'll be joy and there will be sorrow. There'll be happy times that take us to the moon. And then there'll be sad times that we feel like we're the only one left on the face of the earth. With love, there's always going to be risk, and we take risks to love. There's always the possibility of failure, failure of pain. Now, yes, it'll be great joy, but it will be great joy, great sorrow, but we don't stop loving. That's what's important. And so, Mary, a sword shall pierce your heart. Mary did not stop loving. She did not walk away. Love came down in Bethlehem. She chose to embrace him. Now as I close today, I want to show you the Pieta. The Pieta is a uh, statue. And uh, this is a statue. Uh, you may have seen this before. Uh, if you visit some cemeteries, you actually may see uh, this statue. And this is a statue of Mary uh, holding uh, Jesus after he has been uh, taken down from the cross. Now I know, you read through the Bible and it does not say anything about Mary holding her beloved son when his dead body was taken from the cross. But I want you to know, folks, that this is a very real possibility. Mary was there when Jesus was taken from the cross. And Mary, certainly, if she was there, she would have certainly held her beloved child. I want you to think about this. And as you look at this beautiful picture of this statue, you can just see Mary's heart crushed. You see Mary who bore this child, this child that developed in her womb, that she brought into the world. You see the love as she looks down. Now it was not anything on her radar that she could have ever foreseen that this would be what would happen to her beloved son but we certainly see her love as she's holding her beloved son. And through this today, I want us to understand that there is always going to be love 
and sorrow associated with the Advent and with the coming of the Christ child. But we do not take just one, we take them together. Because this is only one part of the story. The other part of the story is that three days later, out from the ground, Christ arose. And so our takeaway this morning will be that there is love, yes, there is joy, but the word of the Lord says that sorrow may endure for a season, but joy comes in the morning. And how do we, how do we react to that? We say, Lord Jesus, here is my broken heart. And when we surrender it to Jesus, great things will happen in our lives. Amen. Let's close today in prayer. Father, as we look at this beautiful picture of Mary holding Jesus, it's hard to picture that just 33 years before this, she held a little baby in her arms and she placed her loved one in a manger. And there was such joy that day and that week in the birth of her son. But then one day we come to this point where she saw her beloved son crucified. But Lord, help us to realize that we don't take just one point in time and then that becomes the rest of our lives. But Lord, we take the advent with the crucifixion, with the resurrection. And Lord, today help us to see that there is in the story of love, there is great love, and yes, there will be great sorrow. But through it all, the Lord said he would be with us. And that one day, our Heavenly Father will take out his big handkerchief and he will wipe away every tear. So I pray, Lord, today for those that have experienced love and sorrow this week. I pray, Lord, that your presence be very strong to them. Hold them close to you and lift them up. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning. We trust that you are safe and that you uh, are not going to do anything about getting out and getting stuck in the snow. And we trust to see you uh, very soon. God bless you.